You're welcome to First Take on TV3. Today I'm in conversation with the Information Minister, Honorable Kojo Opong Nkrumah, on the various key burning issues that have been uh, critical in this last uh, quarter of uh, the Akufuado administration. Thank you very much for joining us. Good day, uh, Mr. Opong Kuma. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on 3FM's first me, day. Jifa. Thank you. And I haven't had the opportunity to congratulate you on your elevation. Uh, congratulations. I know you've been quite busy. Yes, uh, especially at the start of a new tenor like this one. We're doing our best. All right. And at the start of the year, we've seen some key issues, um, issues relating to Galamse, issues relating to COVID vaccine mitigation uh, of, of the vaccine process. Let me repeat that. We've seen uh, key issues being dealt with like Galamse, uh, the vaccination rollout and the mitigation plan for COVID-19, as well as some power sector issues and now the implementation of aspects of the CARES of Atampa uh, program. So let me start first with our COVID-19 <coughs> national vaccination program and the mitigation as of today, we're told that some 100,000 people have been vaccinated over the last uh, five days for the second phase of the program. That still is a far cry from the 20 million Ghanaians we hope to vaccinate by end of 2021. It seems that target is very ambitious, seen as there are issues in the COVID vaccination value chain. What is the plan? I mean, you're right, it's a very ambitious target, and it's a target that we've set because it will be one of the key ingredients to getting the Ghanaian economy back on track. Our ability to vaccinate at least about uh, 20 million people, reach herd immunity as quickly as possible, and then move up to opening the economy for full economic activity to resume. You recall between 2017 and 2019, we had not reached perfection but we were gradually walking up the ladder, albeit with some challenges, and COVID gave us a major shake. If we don't vaccinate about 20 million people, our ability to quickly get the Ghanaian economy back on track uh, will be challenged. Um, at the time we drew that plan, we did not envisage that India, for example, which is um, the country that is being licensed to produce uh, the COVID shield vaccines, uh, on the COVAX platform, one of our most significant contributors, uh, will be hit by this wave that has lost them so many lives and has caused them to literally even shut down their own operations. We did not envisage that many other countries will also be going through an escalated wave that will affect demand uh, while it's affecting supply from India. And the combined effect is that the um, access to the vaccines has not necessarily been as high and as quick as we thought it would be. But what the president has done is to go above the normal procurement channels to begin introducing some diplomatic conversations that are aimed at helping us get, for example, stocks from countries that are quite not sure they can deploy it in good time. So I, you, in reference to the president, he was on an international trip. I'm not sure if he's back from SA yet, but he was in France. I know he's good friends with uh, President Macron. He was in Belgium. Are we getting any from the global, those uh, wealthier countries? Yes, yeah, so um, he has initiated a series of conversations aimed at getting some stock from diplomatic channels beyond the normal procurement um, channels. And actually, some of them have started translating. Some of the stocks that we've gotten from countries that we're not sure they'll be able to utilize them in good time has been because of the diplomatic interventions. COVAX itself is considering Ghana a priority for deployment because we've got a strong deployment system. So when we get it, we can deploy it. And therefore, when COVAX is not sure that a particular country based on their deployment infrastructure can utilize it, uh, we are one of the priority countries that it could be coming to. And we are also, through the president, engaging a number of other countries like you've mentioned do we, know how, do we know how much we're expected to receive? Sir? I'm sure that when the president does come back at uh, 2 p.m. today, um, the detail of how much from where and what time will be made available to us. But the brief as I have it now even includes the possibility of being licensed to bottle some of the vaccines from Ghana and supply the rest of the West African or African sub-region. And of course, that will mean that we will also get a, um, 
uh, a right of first usage within that. So to answer your question, yes, a difficult spot in which we are, yes, an ambitious target, but the president is working to ensure that we can um, overcome this hurdle and still succeed in vaccinating a significant chunk of our population. You mentioned uh, vaccine manufacturing in country. I know that um, in his um, fellow Ghanaian speeches, he had indicated that the expectation is that probably by the end of this year, we will see some manufacturing. So that target is still on track. So you notice I mentioned bottling in country okay. because part of the technology transfer conversations that have gone on from Professor Frimpong Boating's group and from the conversation that the president has been having is that if we can be licensed so that the raw, uh, may I say, materials or whatever is required as the basic formulation is made available for mixing and bottling here in Ghana, then you are not starting the process from zero and it will make it faster. Then you can start off by just focusing on, uh, let's say, mixing and bottling while you work backwards to get a license to do your own formulations based on the licensing agreement. So that is the scope of the conversation currently. And the president's target is that by the end of the year, if hopefully we can get at least one plant locally bottling uh, based on some of these arrangements, it will be a good thing for Ghana. And before I wrap up on issues relating to COVID, satisfied with the deployment of the second phase of the vaccination program so far, certainly we won't be able to vaccinate the almost 800 people who have already received the first shot, yeah. only 350,000 yeah. will get it. What do you want to say to those who are in the next batch that may not receive their vaccine immediately? So two things. One is to be patient and expect to be invited to come and take your second shot. Two is to be aware that the government is working strenuously to get the extra stocks, at least to close up the first, about 900,000 that took the first shot while also getting more stocks from other sources to vaccinate the other segments of the population. The Sputnik vac vaccine, for, ex for example, we've uh, issued an LC for about 300,000 of them. So 300,000 vials of Sputnik. Okay, but you're not telling us the cost. Uh, whether it's I don't have that data okay. now. So, we've, um, so there's a... Um, LC is yes. uh, letters of credit yes. for 300,000 yes. vials. Yes, and Fine. then we are looking to do another about 1 million of the Sputnik uh, so that we can get more stocks from other sources uh, for other segments of the population, even while we close the first uh, 900,000 to 1 million from the COVID shield uh, source. All right. Now, let me move on because from COVID, it has led to unprecedented economic challenges for Ghana and certainly uh, many other parts of the world. One of the things I know that the government has said is, uh, and this is, I quote the Minister of State at the Ministry of Finance, where he says the government is keen to pursue an inclusive, sustainable economic recovery program. Many have challenged that because, um, for instance, 800,000 people, according to the TUC, either lost their jobs or were redeployed or have had to have a cut in salary. Apart from that, we're not seeing um, a big attempt on the government side to reduce expenditure. I've seen some of the charts from the Ministry of Finance in terms of our debt to GDP ratio and what is causing our debt. What do you say to many who feel that it is the CARES or Batampa program, for instance, which is one of the pillars, will not really get us to pre-COVID levels? So I'm going to separate your question into about three. There is the question about what government is doing to reduce expenditure in areas where it can cut expenditure. And then there's the other question on what is the big program? Is it the Ghana Cares or Batampa? And is it well funded to get us to that point? So let's start off with the reduction of expenditure. First of all, we feel the pain of every Ghanaian who is having to uh, take a pinch because of COVID because our brothers, our sisters, our children are included in this. And uh, especially when, for those of us who are MPs, uh, you interact with constituents on a daily basis, you cannot miss the challenging times in which we are. In fact, if you go back to some of the president's speeches earlier, he may not have said it explicitly, but he couched it in a manner that foretold that when you are done with making some successes in the initial fight against the health part of the crisis, you will have challenges 
in the economic uh, aspect of it. The global theory shows us that whenever you have a pandemic of this nature, it's a twin crisis. There's an economic crisis that follows the health crisis. And the president, uh, if you recall, mentioned that we can sacrifice all the economic gains and save lives. Because as for lives, we can't bring them back. But the economy, we can bring it back on track. So we feel everybody's pain. The government, if you would recall, has announced that uh, one of the things that we cannot watch on and do is to, among other things, increase the salaries of government functionaries and presidential appointees at a time when we are going through this kind of crisis. And so on May, the president announced, after a decision had been made at cabinet, that nobody's going to get a salary increase, even though parliament had approved it. I don't wish to dismiss that effort, which is commendable, but it doesn't necessarily translate into big capital um, amounts. I'm going to list the various things that the government has been doing to ensure that expenditure as can be halted or cut in areas that can be cut are being cut. And one of them is, I think, the most demonstrable part that uh, people in government, government functionaries, are not going to get any salary um, increase. You recall that even previously, um, uh, uh, in the first term, people in government had to take a salary cut to assist in some of the intervention programs. Now, beyond that, let's also recall that the government has introduced a higher tax band for people who earn higher incomes, including government officials. These are some of the earliest demonstrable ways of ensuring that uh, at least as much of a cut as can happen on that side takes place. Now, when you come to the main budget, the budget is grouped into about three parts. There's the compensation for employees, there's goods and services, and then there's capital expenditure. If you go into the budget for ministries, departments, and agencies, you will find that a lot of ministries are not necessarily seeing a significant hike in their goods and service budgets per se. Because we are at a time where a lot of emphasis needs to be placed on making funding available uh, to ensure that the economy gets back on track. So unless you are a ministry, department, or agency that is directly involved in that, many of them are not seeing an increase in that particular area. But specifically, then it must translate into what else are you doing? Government has had to increase spending on some of the interventions aimed at getting the economy back on track. Recall us just a few minutes ago talking about the vaccination program and the costs as will be put out uh, 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 shortly on how much that alone is costing us. Uh, recall how much money has been spent on getting schools reopened, getting parts of the economy back uh, reopened. But the Ghana Cares or Batampa program is essentially designed to ensure that we're able to stimulate the critical aspects of our economy that create the most jobs, provide the most incomes for people, and therefore can translate into a higher quality of life for people. Agriculture being one major part, industry being um, another part. Infrastructure, which is one of the fastest ways to get up growth and to get people engaged in many parts of the country. And so you'll notice that between these two, the government is calibrating as much as possible without rocking the boat to see how we can get growth, and not just growth, but growth which has jobs in it back on track. And we've had to do one of the very painful things any government has to do, which is to impose some level of taxes uh, in some aspects of our economy with the expectation that we can raise the resources to deliver on this particular agenda. Then the final part of your question, which comes to the question of um, debt. If you look at our debt numbers, first of all, Ghana's debt position today and the escalation in debt in a year like COVID is comparable to what has happened in many other jurisdictions. The minister responsible for finance quite recently outlined countries like Rwanda, the UK, uh, Canada, many other countries that have had to see an uptick in their debt position because in a COVID year like 2020, when you shut down the economy or aspects of it and revenues are down and you have to increase expenditure, your deficit will widen. I, Honorable Kojo Ponkuma, the issue is about the amount of debt generated and what we have to show for it. Uh, there's a view that the COVID uh, situation should not be counted because we got money to the tune of almost a billion or more from the international financing community. But prior to that, we had already been raking up so much debt, and there's a view that we can't really see what it was spent on. I know government spent on free SHS. I know government did spend on planting for food and jobs and NACO. But the capital projects, like the schools, the hospitals, you know, the road infrastructure, we can't see any of that. So two parts to your question once again. If you take COVID, we got about a billion dollars bring it to cities about six billion cities. The fiscal impact of COVID alone is about 20 something billion cities. 
So the fact that we got one billion dollars, equivalent to about six billion CDs, if you match it against about 23 or so billion CD COVID uh, fiscal impact, cannot match up to it. We've had to do a lot of borrowing, particularly to mitigate uh, some of the challenges we've had in terms of revenue generation because the national revenues were not coming in. Now, sometimes when you borrow money, it may not necessarily be corresponding to a project you are seeing there in a COVID year where revenues are tanking and therefore you need to inject other sources of funding so that you can show up even um, um, compensation for employees. Take government workers, and I'm not saying that that is the uh, reason, but take government workers. If you are not laying off government workers and you're not cutting their salary and the revenues are not coming, somebody's got to pay for it. So if you borrow for your budget and it does not necessarily translate into a project out there, but you've kept things afloat in a COVID year, the analysis that we haven't seen a hospital or a, a particular road for it may not exactly hold up. But let's go back. An increase in the debt stock does not necessarily mean that government has borrowed money for that. And I think we've tried over and over again to explain also, that. Also, because we go to the international bond market, yes. uh, we are told what yes. some of these investments yes. uh, will be made for. Yes. So if you say that it doesn't necessarily translate. Let me just explain. An increase in the debt stock, whenever you see an increase in the CD-denominated debt stock, it doesn't necessarily mean government has borrowed. And I'll give a few examples. Why is it because of a drop in the current the, the state of the, one, the forex? Be, yes, it could be one of the reasons. You could also now have disbursement. So I'll give you a classic example. Yeah, so the, uh, anyways, the, 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 I'd like you to sum it up for me because I think what Ghanaians are just uh, feeling is that we've borrowed all this money. We want to see what it has been used But Ghanaians for. also have to be engaged and an explanation given to the Ghanaian. That, for example, when you see the Temampakadan Railway ongoing, how much is it? What is the loan for that? And you see the percentage of work that had been done as at January 2017. And you see the new disbursements that are coming since then. You will see a corresponding increase in our debt stock, but you ought not to expect a new project other than the Temampakadan Railway that is out there. And there are several projects that are still having ongoing disbursements. Which projects were contracted and perhaps loans taken for them and if you look at the table, sometimes, in fact, the last one I saw, there was one that was as far back as President Kufo's era. So an increase in the CD-denominated debt stock, and I think we have to take time and you know, carry the whole nation along, does not necessarily mean that government has borrowed new money and must show a new project for it. It could be because of old disbursements. It could be because of currency um, uh, fluctuations. It could also then be as a result of drawdown on new um, disbursements. But all in all, the big picture is this. What is our debt sustainability, even after rebasing? If you look at the trends after rebasing, we were actually, with the rebase numbers, in a healthy space until we hit 2020. You can check the numbers. And that 2020, with the unprecedented borrowing that had to come into the economy to hold the economy afloat. This is an economy that had been growing at 7% per annum. And in 2020, it had to go down to about 05 to 0.9%, when many other economies were going in recession. So you needed some injection of borrowed resources to hold it up. Today, because of where we are, we are now in a position to have a conversation about how to clean it all up. And that is why the Ghana Cares of Bad Tampa program, that is why the revenue measures that have been introduced, as pinching as some of them may be, are necessary so that we can clean up and prepare to recalibrate the economy. And speaking about projects, uh, the government pledged to build some 88 district hospitals. It's been amended and upscaled to 111. Yeah. I don't see a single brick anywhere. Well, just, well but you see, um, Jifa, when government is doing projects, um, it does not necessarily mean that from the very first day, the, first, you know, the next day, you see bricks on the ground. Fair point. But I heard has, a story. But has any work begun anywhere? I will come anywhere? to the specific. Yes, some work has begun. And I'll explain. So I heard a story of a project that was counted on paper as ongoing. And I challenged the minister that, but I don't see anything there. And then he explained to me about, for example, contractors mobilizing to site. You will not see a break there, but it doesn't mean that no work is uh, uh, ongoing. Now, in the case of the Agenda 88, which is now being amended to 111, a project committee was set up. It doesn't sit at health ministry per se. A project committee was set up uh, at the office of the president to see to it. All districts were written to, to provide unencumbered parcels of land uh, for it. My understanding is that uh, they have advised the Office of the President on the passes of land available and validation has taken place of a significant 
um, chunk of those parcels of land. And the expectation is that pretty shortly, when they secure the final approval from cabinet, because remember the president said when they are done, they'll get the necessary cabinet approval and announce to the country when they are going on. And when they start, they expect it because of the prefabricated nature of what they want to put up. That's my understanding of what they are doing. When they start, they should be able to finish it within about 12 months. So we all look forward to um, uh, that clearance from cabinet and then that um, announcement that they are good to go on the ground and that within 12 months from going on the ground, they should be able to complete it. So hopefully we will see a 101 regional and district hospital sometime in 2022. So, as I mentioned, we are waiting for the project committee to finish its work, to get the cabinet approval, to do its announcement, and then we can all start counting down the clock from that time. And um, in reference to projects, on Sunday, uh, the roads minister was here, and he gave quite an elaborate and detailed uh, update on what is being uh, done. I know that uh, the information is still sinking in for many, but many are still questioning the source of funding for the 6,000 uh, kilometers of yeah. roads, yeah. projects, and yeah. the 20 yeah. interchanges, yeah. Yeah. which seems very ambitious. Very we ambitious. remember in the Kufo era, he started the Gang of Four yes. roads. It was couldn't finish. Yes, and was completed some six to eight years later. Yeah. As a person who's at least lived through this constitutional era, sometimes it's almost a disservice to build a road for five years because by the time the road is completed, it's choked again. Yeah. So I'm just wondering about this plan in reference to building these 20 Before interchanges. You are to is it is it the is it the uh, deal we have with the Chinese uh, in exchange for bauxite and the not, like that is going to fund this? Not necessarily. So uh, simply put, it's to be funded from multiple sources, including. Um, you know, loans, including the Sino-Hydro transaction, including the road fund and other GOG uh, sources. But let's step back a little. I think you are on to something. This program to complete about 6,000 kilometers out of a, um, a planned 11,000 in the next four years, I think, first of all, is laudable. Indeed, the data suggests, and unless somebody's challenging that data, the data suggests that in the first four years of the Akufuado administration, some about close to 4,000 kilometers were done. If Ghana indeed has a, a road network of 78,000 kilometers, one of the questions we should be asking is, how many kilometers are we doing every four years? Mm -hmm. So in principle, this is a laudable program, but you've hit it right on the nerve. What does it take to fund and complete this program because many contractors will tell you, government gives them a contract, they go on the road and spend a bit of their money, they bring a certificate, it's not paid, the bank that they took the money from is probably collapsing, government has to find another set of you know, funds for the bank, etc., etc. And that's what brings into clear focus the need to have our road funding program properly done. And we as a country need to have an open conversation about it. That's why I, for example, really liked what started with this fix it conversation. It appears to be going down. But it gives an opportunity for us to have a conversation. So what does it take? What is the cost of fixing these roads? How are we funding it? Should we go for some more new loans? roads or building new ones? Sir? Both. Both. I mean, take the... Uh, I, was, I, I drove from Ashongman to Abokobi yeah. yesterday. Yeah. <sighs> Terrible roads. Terrible road. Because but beautiful housing estates, because not simple. I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about single, um, double-storied housing yes. estates yes. line the roads. Yes. Very bad road. Direct road from Ashongman to Abokobi. You yeah. don't have to use the yeah. main highway. Has it been I, done already? No, or? it's it's in a, it's just red light. So, so there are two conversations there. There are roads that need to be fixed. There are roads that need to be built afresh. So for those that need to be fixed... To be fair, they've done the drains. Very well. But no, no... For those that need to be fixed, you'll find instances where the contractor and the consultants did a shoddy job during the period on which they were contracted. And they only had like a one-year warranty period. So within that one-year period, if it survives, it survives. One of the first things that this administration has done is to extend it to five years. That you're going to be responsible... The warranty. Yes, that, that you're going to be responsible for the road for five years. And I think the minister announced it here when he joined us. What does that do? It will cut into the shoddy job that some contractors and some consultants allow to take place if you are now responsible for five years on that road. That's the first part. The second part is that for roads that need to be fixed, it comes back to the same point. We need to find funding so to do. So we have to have a conversation. Do we want to borrow more for our roads? Are we willing to say that, listen, let us borrow some more, and if we can see those roads, we're fine? 
Or are we willing to say, maybe we should increase the road tolls a little bit? When was the last time road tolls were increased? How much does it compare? What goes into the road fund? How many kilometers of road can it maintain or construct? And maybe do we want to pay a bit more? Or is it a combination of these two? Or do we even want to go for um, the tolled road approach where you give the road to a private contractor that find money, build it on your own balance sheet, but toll it? And what rate are we willing to accept if a private contractor is to do that? I mean, that is why I made the point that this conversation gives us an opportunity to confront some of these realities around us, arrive at answers that we can now hold ourselves responsible for. So what is the role of the government? What is the role of the contractor? What is the role of the consultant? What is the role of the citizen? And together achieve this. Honorable Ponkruma, you, the Minister for Roads uh, indicated that they've been building roads for the last four years. I dare say, if the roads are there, no one will complain. No, I don't think so. I think that's too simplistic. Even the 6,000 kilometers of roads that they expect to finish in four years, or the program of 11,000, if you have 54,000 kilometers of roads unfixed and you fix the 11,000, you will still get, what is it, 50,000 kilometers that people will complain about. So the fact that the minister says that in the last four years, they've done close to about 4,000 kilometers, and you can compare that to previous administrations, does not mean that every road in this country has been fixed. Does not mean that we will not find communities that are complaining about it. My road from Oda to Ofoase has been in a terrible state. We now have had a contractor on it who has done a lot of work and now is starting the uh, putting of the bitumen um, on, on, on some portions of the road. Even if you did 4,000, I will complain that my road has not been done. So uh, it would be a bit simplistic to say that um, the fact that you know, he says some uh, have been done and other people complain means nothing's been done. No, I think that what we need to do is to really confront this conversation that what do we all need to do? We need to hold the politician accountable. The minister, you said 11,000 out of which you will finish 6,000. Take the tough decisions and ensure that uh, it's done. Contractors, consultants, they have to do their part, but we the citizens as well. When that conversation is tied up on how to fund what is outstanding on this, I think we also need to come to the table and say, all right, we are willing to pay, I don't know, an extra 10% or 15% to get it. And then when they take our money and don't do it, we can all go on Aluta. A big issue uh, your government has had to confront in this, should I say, the last uh, five months has been the issue of uh, illegal small-scale mining, Galamsey. Yeah. So there's been a national conversation about how we deal with illegal small-scale mining or artisanal mining, and this has gone to the regions. Um, in the last two phases of the Operation HALT program, um, we've seen some 85 excavators uh, being destroyed, 622 chang fans, one fuel pump, 105 water pumps, and that's from your recent Meet the Press. This approach, certainly laudable, is not sustainable. What is the sustainable way to ensure that small-scale miners can operate going forward? I think first thing is to make the point quite clearly that the government is not against mining or small-scale mining in general. Mining has been with us for centuries. It's been a source of economic activity for many communities and for many people. And the government does not have a problem with mining or small-scale mining in general. What the government has declared as a red zone is mining in water bodies or close to water bodies. And, and indeed, what is by the extension, demarcation? Is it the 100 meters from the water body? Because that has been a source of debate, I'll sir. speak to that one. But in principle, the red zone is water bodies and 100 meters from the water bodies and forest reserves. In fact, even currently, the Operation Halt is just dealing with water bodies and 100 meters from water bodies. I'll explain the exception to that rule shortly. But in principle, this is what the government is fighting now because there's absolutely no basis to have an excavator or a chamfire machine out there in any river or stream or tributary anywhere in this country uh, for any reason whatsoever. In a water body or 100 meters from the water body is legally a no-go area for mining. So all of these chamfire machines that are being found out there are engaged in illegalities. All of these excavators in water bodies are engaged in illegalities. 
And the Commander-in-Chief of the Ghana Armed Forces has authorized the forces to ensure that all persons and logistics are removed. They have their own operational methods of ensuring that they are removed, uh, that they are immobilized in that space. Of course, they can't even just leave it there. At some point, they have to ensure that uh, a proper reclamation exercise is done. That becomes a sustainable effort. The degradation now needs to be counted, um, whether through natural or other chemical means. There are many places, if I went to the PRA, aquatic life is gone. You stand by the PRA and you see chemicals. The Ghana Water Company Limited machines for pulling the water to process for people of the central region go dead almost every God knows how many years and they have to buy new pumps. So the challenge is real out there. So for those in water bodies, that is what the effort is concentrated on. Okay, so this project is, uh, or this operation is dealing with water, water bodies. Okay. And 100 meters from water from bodies. Water but bodies. Just to clarify, okay. so does that mean that after that aspect is done, we will embark on another operation to deal with, with the those... forest reserves. Yes, please. I expect that we'll deal with the forest reserves subsequent to this one. But for now, the terms of reference, as I've seen them, deal with the water bodies. So if you have an excavator in a water body or a chamfine machine in a water body or 100 meters from a water body, the soldiers will come for you because you have no business being there. What this tells me is that whether this is a small scale miner or a galamsea, what this tells me is that there is no proper water supply and disposable system for them to operate their mining activities. Isn't providing such a system a sustainable way to allow uh, small-scale mining, legal small-scale mining, to continue? Because as it is, it looks like even those who are operating legally don't have that proper water supply and they disposal. Have elected, they have elected not to do that. And I'll explain. No mining in water or 100 meters from water is not a new rule, it's there. Those who do mining, whether large scale or small scale, have their modus operandi on A, how to get water, and B, how to dispose of their water on their concessions. So you dig boreholes, you build your reservoirs, use the borehole to do your work, and you dispose of it accordingly. What some of them have elected to do is that no matter how far they are from the river, they connect pumps to the river, suck the water to their uh, plants, use it to process with all their chemicals, and pour the water back into the water bodies. Okay, so what is the difference between that and using a chamfire machine in the water all bodies? Right, so th that's why I'm raising, so my main question is really about after the operations, the sustainability of what we want to after do. The if we want gov If we want operators to operate sustainably and safely and efficiently, what? maybe government will have to step in and intervene in providing some of these systems to ensure that these abuses are curbed. No, so two things. The fact that those solutions have not been outlined, assuming they are new solutions, will not negate the need for the operation to go on now. Secondly, those who want to mine properly, they know the modus operandi of doing that. You dig your borehole, you use it, you so dispose you of it there. And, and they don't the need government system. to tell them how to do that. In that regard, those who want to do it are well-equipped, well-skilled. They have the law, they have the regulations, they know how to do it. And if you are doing it that way, there's no problem. It is for those who have connected, and you've seen the Ghana Armed Forces videos that they put. Sometimes they put the people by the water body. There's one video of a Chinese person where the soldier is speaking to him. His mind is not actually within the 100 meters, according to the brief I have. It's outside, it's, or the people he's mining with, they have the necessary concession. But they've connected their pumps to the water body and are creating the same problem. So those ones as well, the, um, uh, the Ghana Armed Forces will have to respond to that in that particular way. But if I, there's community mining. There are small-scale mining. There is large-scale mining, which can all be done in a proper and legal way. And to the extent that anybody is doing that in a proper and legal way, government doesn't have a challenge with you. It is only when you come close to the water bodies and you uh, 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 do this level of catastrophic damage to the water and aquatic life that the Ghana Armed Forces will have a challenge with you. There are also those who complain that they were neither within the catchment area nor drawing water from it, but have been affected. I think those are matters that already the Ghana Armed Forces and the Ministry for Lands have commenced investigations to determine whether the soldiers went out of bounds or whether these persons are not telling the truth. And the details of that investigation will determine the next course of action. All this work, very laudable. I've seen on social media uh, people praising the work, particularly now that the Pra River color is returning gradually. 
But why haven't we seen any arrests and prosecutions? There were some 10 Chinese, eight of them ran away, two of them were eventually arrested. I'm not saying we should arrest Chinese, but I'm just saying that part of this whole process means there must be consequence management, and we are not seeing that at all. Well, to the contrary, my check from uh, the legal department of the National Security Ministry that is coordinating this suggests that the persons who have been arrested have been arraigned. You know there's a whole criminal process, especially with the new law, where first they will be arraigned, their pleas will be taken, and then a full, uh, uh, um, they'll be remanded in custody, and then a full trial would uh, ensue. My understanding from what Dixon briefs me on from National Security's legal department is that the first arraignment has taken place, and that they are now expecting that a full trial will unfold. But you are very right. Um, I think some of the decisions in the past, Aisha Huang and other things, have been proven uh, not to have been the best steps at that point in time. And there's a need to ensure that proper legal redress is brought to persons, whether they are Ghanaians or of other nationalities, who are found engaging in these Ill uh, 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 illegalities. And I do know that the President's instructions to the Attorney General is to ensure that such persons, once the initial arraignment is done, are properly prosecuted before the courts and that the law is applied well in that way. Not to belabor the point, but there were instances or allegations of purported natural, national security operatives involved in uh, Galamse yeah. or trying to uh, there's a group of uh, young in the Etiwa forest yes, a group and of the like. Men. What is happening to them? So first, let's commend the youth of that community for effecting that arrest. They effected the citizens' yes. arrest, handed them over to the police. The police, military, and national security then moved in to have them taken and brought to Accra and arraigned before court. When they were investigated, it was found out that contrary to the initial reports that they were national security operatives, they are not national security operatives. However, there's a contractor who worked with national security who hired them to go and do that. So the person they linked to uh, is somebody who was a, a contract employee of national security. That person, I understand, was also arrested, and they were all arraigned before court. Indeed, I think earlier this week or late last week, they were put before court uh, and have been remanded in custody. And it's part of the instructions the president has given the attorney general to ensure that prosecutions take place. If people are innocent... It would be good to update the Ghanaian people in a more open and I transparent I even read it in the newspapers. Manner. That's as open and transparent <laughs> as it gets. But I get your feedback yes. that perhaps the data on the or Especially in reference to the mining, the arrest... I should think, also be made more public. I think public. it needs to be made more public. Very well. All right, so let me move away from that because mining brings revenue to the state. Yeah. And uh, many of... Um, the economic activities are very important to our country's uh, income generation activities. Now we are told that government, well, I guess the president brokered that deal where we are securing a 170 million euro facility yeah. for the establishment of a new uh, national development bank. Yeah. Um, I understand that some $250 million yeah. is being secured from the World Bank. Yes. All right. Um, and then the government of Ghana has also made a contribution of $200 million okay. out of a budgeted 250 to capitalize the bank. All right, that's good to know. So that's already hitting some 500 million uh, US dollars for more. the yeah. development bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's been some criticism, I'll get into what the bank, but there's initial comments from you, the criticism that we have the uh, Agric Development Bank, we have the NIB, National Investment Bank, they're hemorrhaging money, they're not doing very well financially, they are not one of the big players out there if you're talking about the banking yeah. sector. Yeah. Why not channel some of this funding yeah. there? It can then generate job no, opportunities. That's a solid question. That's a solid question, but... I think it means that we have to explain the difference between a development bank and the commercial bank. <laughs> this is for infrastructure. No, you are saying. no. Oh. So you see, the commercial banks, ADB, and okay, not to interrupt you. Maybe I should repeat this part. So, are you saying then that the Agri Development Bank and the NIB, the National Investment Bank, are now performing the role of a commercial bank? They are actually commercial banks. Yeah. You know that the commercial banks have what we call a universal banking yes. license. So APSA, Stanchat, yeah. ADB, NIB, they are all commercial banks. The problem with the commercial banks is that because the savings culture in Ghana is low, I go and put my small thousand cities there, and I may go for it next two weeks. You put yours there. You have more money than I do. So you put yours there. You may go for it <laughs> after a while. So what ends up happening is that the bank does not have access to a large pool of cheap funds to on lend particularly to the productive sectors of the economy. And especially when you have an economy where government is the biggest business or single entity business participator. And government gives contracts 
and revenue measures are not strong enough to pay contractors. <clears throat> you find out that people take loans from the banks, they have difficulties in paying those loans, and the banks are you know, going to have challenges down the line. So if you study what happened after the Second World War, a lot of countries that managed to turn the economic tide when the fiscal space was constrained used development banks. Singapore, Germany, Japan, Brazil. So a development bank is a wholesale bank that is able to mobilize large chunks of money at cheap rates from governments and international development partners and make those funds available to the commercial banks so that the commercial banks can then now do the real work like what you expect them to do in the commercial banking area based on this, uh, their specialization. If you want ADB to lend to farmers or to people who are operating greenhouses, I've had lots of young people come say, I want to do a greenhouse and I need credit. The normal commercial banks don't have access to long-term cheap money to give to them. But if you had a development bank that is able to borrow 700 or, or 150 million euro from the European bank at an interest rate of 0.5%, over 20 years, and to give that money to ADB, then ADB can take care of that young man from Ofoasi who wants to start a greenhouse and create a number of jobs there. So actually, what the Development Bank is going to do is to help solve part of the problem of the commercial banks. They won't compete with the commercial banks. They won't take business away from the commercial banks. They're actually going to make funding available to the commercial banks. I hear the critique, and I think it's a legitimate critique, that 170 million euro is a loan are we not adding to our debt stock? It's a fair critique, but the question also flipped on the other side is, will the commercial banks be truthful in ensuring that they apply this money for the purposes and the rates that is being given to them? And will you and I, Jifa, be truthful when we take that money from the commercial bank? So that over a 20 year period, we take it, we build our businesses, we pay back, they can give it to the next person, he pays back. And when it is due for the uh, National Development Bank to pay, they can pay back. But I also throw that question back to you as government. Yeah. Can we be sure that government will be truthful about what the Development Bank is supposed to do and whether it will deliver on the mandate within the span of time that it is given? So the answer to that lies in the corporate governance structure that is being put about the Development Bank. You remember the Minister responsible for Finance said that we are not just limiting it to a few Ghanaians to sit there. We believe in Ghanaian talent. But we're actually opening it up to the best practitioners in development banking from all over the world and the headhunt for the best brains all over the world to run this National Development Bank of Ghana uh, is on. And I'm hopeful that by the time they are done and they put out the names, we would be clear in our mind that this is not, you know, um, an assemblage of like-minded people who so this, will be untruthful setting, with it. So the setting up of this bank is not going to be business as usual, where we just have appointees I'll put I'll be in disappointed place. if it's business as usual. Then we haven't manifested the change that we requested of the Ghanaian people. But when that is done, we also have a responsibility that when we take that money, we will pay, and when we pay, the bank can continue to grow like the German Development Bank, KFW, has done, Japan, Brazil, and all other countries, Singapore, etc., have done. And um, is it true that people have already been recruited to fill roles in this development bank? I've been I'm not informed aware of, I'm that not some aware people of that. have already had their, they're just waiting for July for everything I'll to I'll be take happy off. to see who these persons are because I'm not aware of that. The brief as we have it is that this headhunt, even for the board, is now ongoing for the board to be announced, the bank to come into effect, and then management and then, you know, the skeletal staff do have. And please remember, this is not a bank that's going to have branches across the country. It's a wholesale one-shop bank sitting somewhere here in Accra, raising big money and making it available to the banks uh, on, 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 on High Street in Accra. Not to belabor the point, but will... Oh, let me rephrase the question. Not to belabor the point, but there's also a concern that, yes, you have this good money that will be seed money for the bank, I hope we won't spend a lot of it setting up fancy infrastructure and setting up fancy uh, offices and buying fancy cars. Well, a few minutes ago, you were asking about infrastructure. That's just by the by. Well, uh, we, but we, we definitely, an office is good, but obviously we no, don't No, we don't to. expect the bank to have a full rollout across the country. It's supposed to be a small shop uh, that can mobilize and make funding available to the banks. That is their core purpose. And if you find that they are spending, what, more than, is it 5% or whatever, of their money on this purpose, then it means you are getting into trouble. You want them to you know, spend the bulk of the money on their real purpose and not on themselves. So what happened to Ghana Beyond Eight if we still have to borrow? I thought we were working towards being self-sufficient, sir. Well, being self-sufficient reference to aid, and I think it was quite specific, 
was that we want to move away from the system where the world now comes to us to say, we have seen a problem here, take some money and solve it. That's it. We want to get to a point where two things are happening. We are improving domestic resource mobilization and putting that money where we think our priorities lie. And two, even if we are going to get partnerships, development partnerships from other parts of the world, we will be in a position to tell them that this is what we are doing and we think that you can support this that we are doing. That's the concept of Ghana Beyond Aid. So take even the development bank. It is our decision that we are creating a development bank because we want to fund the priority areas of growth in this republic. And if the European bank is minded to assist us with 170 million euro as a loan, we will take that and put it into our vehicle, deliver on the purpose and pay back. That is Ghana Beyond Aid. And if the World Bank is minded to support a purpose like this, we'll take that, put it into our boat, deliver, recoup and pay back. That is very different from sitting here with our hands between our thighs and expecting one white man to come and say, I have noticed that there's a problem with malaria, so I'm giving you aid of X amount of money um, to solve it. Take COVID. When we make a determination that we want to vaccinate our population, about 20 million of them, and that we will buy X number, we will work on uh, bottling local vaccines on Y number, but there's a global platform that is also distributing to countries that already contribute to the COVAX platform, and we contribute, so we are part of it. So give us this portion of it for it. That is part of the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda. We're in the, um, the last ends of this conversation. So um, let me come to some pretty you know, controversial issues of, as well that have come up. Um, fix the country. Group of young people, faceless young people, who uh, took social media by storm some three weeks ago, pushing on issues that they believe uh, should be fixed in the country. And um, government responded by indicating what work he was doing, the finance minister. Is there any opportunity to meet them further and engage in a bit to update them on what is being done? Because just happy, addressing yeah. the media briefing was good, but I haven't seen...